afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you, Berkman Center, for inviting me to come here and learn from you all today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, we've heard a great case today about why it is that legal materials in Massachusetts should be available online. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to this point and how we could potentially change the future. Um, and I should mention that although I'm a general counsel for a state agency, my comments don't necessarily reflect the views of the administration. Although they're great on technology. So the story I have to tell is really a combination of law, money, and stakeholders. Um, and starting uh, with the legal piece, our state government is like every state government in the United States. We have a tripartite government. Our state constitution establishes a number of elected officials what are called constitutional offices, and then you have your three branches of government. And it's against that foundation that the technology used by the state has really developed. In addition, um, so when you look at the environment that people have described today, you see that it's very vulcanized, it's very patchwork. There are bits of public law all over the place on the websites of a whole series of different entities. Um, there is no one-stop shopping, one place that you can go, even within the state government umbrella, to find all the law that happens to be available online, including statutes, administrative decisions by agencies, their policies or regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll talk a little bit about how we got there. So you start with the fact that government is divided and technology gets built on whatever the sort of cultural uh, and governmental infrastructure exists, so that was the infrastructure. In addition, in 1974, uh, our, the Supreme Judicial Court issued a decision in the opinion of the justices. They were asked in that case to address the constitutionality of legislation proposed in the legislature that would have created a central multi-branch entity that would have done what was at that time called uh, e basically EDP, electronic data processing. In those days, people sat at uh, little dummy terminals and they typed in data and it went into these huge, vast machines that filled rooms and batch processing was run. So uh, the court said in that case that it would be unconstitutional for the state to have one central IT organization that was run by its kind of a, a troika of representatives from the three branches because in that case, representatives from one branch would have some control uh, over the data of and for the business processes of other parts of state government. Perhaps not a very surprising decision uh, given the state constitution of, of, of every state in the United States, and in particular in Massachusetts. Uh, so they're trying to ensure that the technology infrastructure mimicked the separation of powers that our constitution creates. And that, that decision and our constitution and that fact of how our government is established is the parent, in some ways, of the problems that we're talking about today. Because today there is no, and there can be no, central content czar who dictates what law is going to be put online, in what form, and, what, and with what access rights for people. There cannot be, in Massachusetts by law, one central content czar for all the different parts of, of state government. But I, I would maintain that's not an insuperable obstacle to obtaining the goals that people have articulated today. So um, state government has evolved, electronic government has evolved since 1974. Um, in 19, uh, 98, there was a report of an online government task force that identified that we had 80 agency websites in the state. And again, that reflects the balkanization piece. The Secretary of the Commonwealth has one. The Department of Public Health had one. Uh, the Department of Corrections had one. Every, everyone was popping up with their own home little website. And that um, report criticized those sites uh, for having uh, a high percentage, that report in a later report in 2001, for having a high percentage of what people were calling brochureware, just stuff that's published online. When these first sites started coming up, what did people put online? They tended to put their law up, actually, because they really weren't sure what they're supposed to be doing with their site. The public was pressuring uh, government to have sites. We wanted to have sites. So it wasn't very transactional in the early days. People were publishing, uh, in, a, in, a, in a small way, their rights and statute and even legislation, things, things like that. Um, gradually, and you can see this in the 2001 e-government strategic plan and the 2003 IT Commission report, there's a lot of emphasis in the planning efforts on doing more transactions online. So people are saying, well, uh, just sticking a bunch of law up online, that doesn't mean anything to citizens. People want to be able to register their car online. They want to be able to apply for a grant online. So focus your attention not on the content, but on the activities that people can engage in online. And that, of course, was of great value, and that's why you can register your car in Massachusetts online instead of standing in line, and that's actually a very good thing for people. 
At the same time, it diminished the importance of the kind of activity that you've been speaking about today, which is the importance of making uh, certain, the data that the state holds uh, available to the public. So the historic trend, um, the, the pendulum has swung a little bit in the other direction lately. The state of Massachusetts and many other states have become involved in the open data movement. Uh, the open data movement, we've gotten uh, a lot of stakeholder su strong suggestions to us that we should start exposing some of these huge databases we have. And uh, various government agencies at the federal, state, and county level across the US are doing this to great effect. We expose the data. And uh, developers are very interested in developing applications that make it easier for residents uh, of counties, cities, states to, to use that data in new and interesting ways. We've had great success with the MBTA uh, recently with exposing data about transit schedules. So it turns out there's a great community. You know, we know there's a great community of very active developers in the Boston area and elsewhere who are thrilled to take that data and in a couple of hours write fantastic applications that people love to use that tell them how the bus is coming. Those are wonderful things to do. But uh, when I was trying to put together my thoughts today, I wrote across the top of the page, who knew? Because I had absolutely no idea that people felt that we should also expose our legal data as we're exposing our database data. You know, little bits and bytes about where the buses are and how many people registered their car last year. So I think one of the things that I see in the history of what's going on here is uh, the, the central IT organizations may not have been aware that their stakeholder groups articulating a very clear case for uh, treating uh, the law that agencies hold in their coffers in paper, or maybe just in bits and pieces on the website, treating it as if it were open data, like the open data that we are now starting to expose uh, from, from our large, large system. So I think there's currently just a, um, there's, there's currently just a communication uh, issue. So that's how we got there is the law drives uh, balkanization in state technology enterprise. Uh, the, both at the constitutional level and the level of this decision. And so people have been very consistent about setting up their technology to mimic the legal structures that create the state. And those very structures are frust would frustrate an effort to come up with some kind of a contents art and say, OK, let's come up with a page and we'll make sure everybody can get access to all the law here. We don't really need a contents art to do it. That's why it hasn't happened in the past. But there's no reason people couldn't voluntarily get together and decide to work together to create a site or a page where people could go to get access to this information. And a few other things that struck me this morning while I was listening to speakers was that um, there is uh, some concern with authenticity when we talk about putting law online. And I think when you see the uh, copyright notices uh, that you're seeing on uh, the, the uh, legislature's website, and I don't represent the legislature, so I can't speak for them, but. There's always a concern in government about the authenticity of materials that people are quoting from us. So if you're quoting me and saying, you know, quote, saying that the Department of Revenue reached a decision about something, and you've got an electronic document that purports to show what the Department of Revenue has said, I want to make sure that you haven't come up with a bootleg version of what the Department of Revenue actually said, because that's law. And government agencies hold their law close to the vest, and in part, they hold the text close to the vest, the text themselves, because there's a they have a sort of sacred nature in, in the public sector. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone's in agreement about what the sacred original text actually says. Uh, and in this society where it's increasingly difficult to get people to agree about facts, I think there's some legitimate concern that if you don't authenticate, uh, electronically authenticate those legal documents before they go up online, and others are allowed to concatenate them and republish them, that perhaps they will not be quoted uh, exactly. And this is not just a theoretical Fear. These are fears that, that uh, have been expressed by people as we talk about the e-government enterprise. And uh, just, just one more point I wanted to make uh, is that we do have, or two more points. Our state is the only state in the union that uses information technology bond funds, capital funds, to build out its IT infrastructure. And that money has been, on the whole, spent wisely and well to build a very robust e-government <coughs> infrastructure. But the people who make the decisions about how that money is spent are not hearing from the people in this room about how there's a, a growing sense among some people that more law should be online. So I think there's a need for the stakeholders in this area uh, potentially to coalesce and make their case uh, to those who decide how investments are made in the state um, in information technology. It's a very wise decision made on the part of the Commonwealth. It, it has the, the information technology bonds have persisted through multiple administrations and multiple parties, and they made a great contribution to the state, so we do have some resources 
uh, to do some things with technology that might help achieve goals, but somebody has to articulate to me. I would say that the technology enterprise in government is a lot more responsive than many other parts of government simply because we're not very heavily regulated and we don't regulate anybody. So when external stakeholder groups have carefully articulated their needs and their visions, the technology enterprise can change. You know, residents of Massachusetts want social media, so we're now you know, doing Flickr and YouTube and, and, and everything else that you can imagine in, this, in the um, social media realm. Residents in Massachusetts were concerned about the accessibility of the technology that we were using and proposing to use. And they articulated their needs very clearly. And we have changed over the past four or five years to become very, very conscious about disability accessibility. But your case has not been made. Uh, so I, 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 I think it's a, it's a very credible and interesting case. And there are a lot of people in the executive department who might be interested in it. But the case has to be made uh, by stakeholders who can articulate you know, a specific goal they want to achieve, and perhaps how the resources of the state could be used uh, to get there. So without further ado, I'm going to tackle it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Meg Hayden with the Law Libraries, and I'm beyond excited to be here. I think my entire professional career has been about bringing the law to the people, and so long before we had computers to do it. So I'm, I'm thrilled that this is finally getting somewhere, and Judge Fine's remarks about procedural information is such an important component to what we do, because as you get more and more information to lay, lay people, to self-represented litigants, there's not much they can do with it. And so that piece of thank you for giving me the law, but now what? It's, it's very exciting to see that somebody will be addressing that. I'm going to just show you the primary Massachusetts sources that we have available on our site and kind of where they come from and what's missing and why. Um, we started our site in about 1997, which was before the court system as a whole had a website. And that's why the law library site has remained outside of the domain of the courts. Um, by the time the courts had a website, ours was quite large, and um, it, w it was too difficult for them to just subsume us into the courts structure. So we've always operated autonomously. It's also true that our data is quite different from what the court provides, because we're not making an official court statement. We're making a library statement. Here's some stuff about a topic. Not stuff that the court endorses, not stuff that a particular judge wants you to use, but just stuff to read about a topic. So we have, we have basically three sections to the site. There's the laws by subject, which is where we put most of our energy, and I'm not going to talk about that now, but we, we bring together, so if someone were facing an eviction, they would go to law about eviction and get the laws and the statute and the regulations and so on. Um, and then there's library stuff, and then there's the primary law. So primary law started on the web uh, let me see if I have the year. 1998, late 98, the Mass General Laws went online from the legislature. And so what we've done here is just have, have a link to where you can search by citation or search by, by phrase. And obviously there's inherent problems in searching full text general laws because if the words you're using don't appear in the law, you're not going to find it. And so in a little bit I'll show you this popular name table that some of our staff members created to get at the laws that are known by something, by a word that's never going to appear within the text of the word, of the law. So after the Mass General Laws went up, suddenly our website became more than just a directory of, hi, here we are, and here's our addresses, and we didn't really know what to put on the web. Suddenly it was like there's actual content out there, and we began to wonder what other content was out there. And so in about 1999, we started looking for the regulations, and as Linda mentioned, these agencies were all operating quite independently, and so some agencies were putting up their regulations and some weren't. And what we would do was go to mass.gov, which had a different name at the time, and, and go to every agency alphabetically and look through their site for something that looked like regulations, because sometimes they wouldn't call them that. Um, and so we created a list, and at the time it was quite small. This is it now. Still basically works the same way. We no longer go agency by agency. But by citation, if you go to this, it will give you the departments, and then within each department, it links to their regulations. Um, we also have an index, and the index we had been creating in print is probably a lot of law libraries had. When the CMR first came out, it didn't have an index. And so good little librarian indexers had made these homemade indexes over 20, 30 years. 
And so we put our index up with links. Um, but for the regs now, what we do is we get them from the agency websites, and then when the mass register comes out, which updates the regs every two weeks, we go through that in print and compare it to the agency's regulation that's online. If it's current, the link stays. If it's not, we put up the regulation ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple examples of regulations, um, and every agency does this differently. Uh, so this is the Department of Transitional Assistance, which from my mind gets an A+, plus, and, and the big reason is you can see that they have dates on them. So that if, and each page has its own date. Now I don't know if this one is going to, so you can see this one has a different date. So if something changed on a given date, it's easy not only for me, but for the user to look at it and know that that reg is current as of whatever date. Then there's departments that make them look very pretty, and, and again, they're very useful, but it just requires more work on our part to go through and make sure that it's current. So if I go to, let's see, this was in 209. Um, this is 209 CMR 31, very user-friendly. It, it prints well and you can, you can get through it, but there are no dates. And so for this one, when the mass register comes out, we find out that subsection 0.02, subset 2, whatever changed, and we read word for word to be sure that what they have on the web is current. Um, it used to be when the agency sites were more separate that you could kind of look at the directory structure of a given website and see when those files were uploaded and get a clue about that. Uh, we have less clue now <laughs> in, the, in the kind of database-driven format that they're in now. So, uh, so that is fairly time consuming. So those are two of the more common ways that they look. And then the third option is if we have had to add it, um, let me get to 103. Uh, so this is one that we put up. And what we do with ours is make them look just like the print. So anybody who's got the print, it's got the date at the bottom of every page. And that just makes it easier for us when we are updating it to be able to know that it's the same the same content as the print. So that's how the CMR works. It's obviously labor intensive, um, much less so now than it used to be because more and more agencies are putting their information up. And so um, when a reg shows up in the mass register, probably 80% of the time it is on the web. And of those, maybe a third of the time it's out of date. So somewhere around 50% or so are up there and fine, and then the rest require, require some effort. So the CMR index, which uh, you know every library does these things, is just a handmade thing. But it does basically the same thing. It just provides subject index into those regulations. And there are items here that are listed but are not linked because those regs aren't up. We're not systematically going through the CMR and adding all the regs that are not available. We're only doing them as they're updated. and so. And we've been doing that the, as they're updated for about two years. So I don't know how long it will take to ever get to some of these agencies. Uh, can, can I ask yeah. a quick question? Yeah. So this is the CMR. There's also the official CMR, the $155. The secretary, bar. yes. When, when an agency. So you're, you're replicating that, basically? Um, poorly. Yes. Poorly, but poorly. <laughs> yes, I, I wouldn't say I'm replicating that because that's a much better. When, when an agency promulgates regulations, they do their little public hearings and stuff. Then those regulations go to the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. uh, the Secretary of State pu pulls it all together into the code and sends them out in print. And they also create a database of all of these regulations. They're the only ones who have them all. Mm -hmm. And they sell that. But this is a shadow, essentially. Of yes. We, I mean, we have never, Marty and I were discussing this earlier, it's 110 bucks, and we don't buy it on principle. You know, right. So here we are holding on to our honor and going through all this labor. I mean. There's something kind of stupid about it. We don't know that it would be 110 because as soon as we get it and we want to load it everywhere, 110 is one That's of the first. That's true. That's true. So we don't know what the price would be. So uh, I know we're not supposed to talk about money in polite company. Yes. But how much do you spend to <laughs> make the CMR? It's you. Um, and it's a percentage of And I don't get paid time. that much money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How yeah. much time do you spend? On this? Yeah. You I actually have a little bit of help with this. Yeah. Um, it's a small, you'll see there are a lot of other things that we're doing. This is a small piece of it. I would say the subject part of it is, is a bigger part of my time. But if the CMR gave you rights to their publication, oh, then, then you'd be done, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, if, if, right. If we could, if we could have it and believe it was current, you know, if it, right, if it came from a reliable source. I mean, you want to double do check and add a absolute forever access and so there's a lot of work we do that that seems goofy and and it's because we're trying to make certain that something is sort of platform independent and oh that's not goofy uh, okay thank you for that <laughs> okay so with the general laws and the CMR there's this indexing issue and so this is the product of a couple of my colleagues I won't take credit for it because they put a lot of work into this and went through when laws are called something that's not in the law. So here we've got Lemon Law. And there are actually Lemon Laws about other things like pets and wheelchairs. But it, it links to things that people would want. And although it was supposed to be at first just for the general laws, we found out a lot of those things. People don't know that this is a law, or this is a reg, or this is a case. And so things here, like the lamb warning, is a case. And I'll talk about cases in a little bit. And so the, the popular name table pulls together things where the user doesn't need to know if this is a law or a reg or a case. They just know, you know, chapter 766 is special education. Well, anyone in a public library knows that, but 766 of what? That doesn't really mean anything in the mass general laws. And so those kinds of things we pull together by name uh, to just create more utility for it. And that's something that obviously is updated regularly. And it's that kind of thing that we try to spend more staff, more staff time on, is the actual analysis and um, using your brain in some way. Uh, so that was, let me get back home. So that's the, the general laws and the regulations. And around the same time, maybe a year or two later, we started adding executive orders from the governor because they were hard to come by. And we had them in print. But we didn't really have them anywhere else. And so this was sort of a massive scanning job. And we scanned all the executive orders and, um, and linked to them. And now I only link to them in text form because um, the PDFs were sort of unwieldy and not terribly handicapped accessible. But we do have them in PDF if people really wanted the whole signature and all of that stuff. And then Governor Patrick came along in 2007 and was the first governor to put his executive orders online. So, now with the newer ones, we only link to the governor's site. So, you know, up through 2007, we, we scanned them as they came in. Again, in the, in the beloved mass registers where they would show up, so it was another part of that whole process. And then we've created an index, again, kind of a labor-intensive thing. And one of the important things here is that it just keeps track of what revoked what. Um, we used to have to call the governor's office for this information. And often their records weren't clear about what was superseded by what. And, um, so that's executive orders. So that came about you know, a little bit after the CMR. And that seemed doable because we finally had a scanner. So that was exciting. But also because executive orders are static documents. And we began to think about you know, a static document that doesn't change. The regulations change. And you have to take out this subsection and put in this subsection. An executive order may get over, you know, may get revoked, but it is what it is. It doesn't change, um, and so that made executive orders sort of a nice, a nice place to start. Um, the state agency opinions. I'm only going to mention this very briefly because we have very few of them. If we happen upon opinions from a state agency that issues rulings, we include them here. We don't really go looking for these, and. They are um, date-wise kind of all over the map. You know, the Department of Environmental Protection is from 2004. Some of them, Ethics Commission, 2002 to 2006. Uh, so we haven't done much with agency opinions, and would love to see somebody bring those things, bring those things together. And in the same way with city and town bylaws, 
we find them and link to them. And in this one, we do a systematic search. There's 350 some towns in the state. That's not an overwhelming number. And we search them and find their bylaws and link to them. And obviously, these, these links of all of the website are the ones most prone to change. These break every day because the cities change the name of the bylaw file or whatever. Um, and so they're all here, which is nice if you want the bylaws for your town. Less useful if what you want is I want to see leash laws in every town in western Massachusetts where there isn't a good way to compare one provision from place to place. Um, with some of them, if they're using the same vendor, you can compare the towns that all use Municode or all use, oh, what's the other one? <laughs> um, but, but again, that's a small subset of the cities and towns. Okay, so then we get into the court rules. And the court rules were interesting because I was on a committee that, that did the court systems website. And the people on this committee, all of whom were very bright, capable people, were uncomfortable about putting the court rules on the court's website. <laughs> <laughs> and it had to do with intellectual property. It had to do with them not fully believing they owned their own rules. Um, and the issue, the issue was that they, they issued their rules in 1974. And then when they amend a rule, they would put out a piece of paper that said, Rule 6, paragraph 2, is hereby amended, take out the word and, and put in the word or. That was the only official thing they ever issued. So they never compiled the <coughs> amendments into the rules and put out an official rule book. And so their feeling was that because they had never compiled that information, they didn't own that information. Um, and so we started just putting a few rules up that people needed a lot. So we started with like civil procedure rule 12, or rule, and, and bit by bit, <coughs> we added the rules, uh, years and years ago. <laughs> um, and so now we have nearly all of the Massachusetts rules. Um, Massachusetts has a lot more court rules than I realized, and some things that are almost rules but not quite rules, um, and so now we're into those quasi-rules things, things like standing orders um, of more obscure courts. So we just added the standing orders of the district court. Um, I'd say we have five or six of these little subsets of things to add. But certainly we have more of the court rules than anywhere else on the web. Um, and we do make an effort. The court's great about emailing me when rule changes are coming. And so this one is one where there's a nice cooperation and so it's it's fairly easy to keep this to keep this up to date so that's so that's the rule so that just kind of happened um, organically um, quick question on the yeah rules. so how if, if all the courts do is issue these periodic little change rule 6.2 changes yeah. what did you use to create the whole body of rules if you want to say I'm trying to decide that. Um, in fact, we used a lot of sources because there isn't an official. We weren't happy with anything being the official rules of Massachusetts. And it's interesting when you get into rules questions and call the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, nobody is clear on what the official rule is. There isn't, there isn't one put out that isn't by a publisher. So we would sit with all of the books. Um, we would go on all of the databases. And then we would get the text from a source that the licensing agreement did not prohibit us doing that. Um, but in many cases, many, many cases, Westlaw and Lexis are quite different. I mean, I would say 25, 28% of the time, many cases. And so for us, that was very eye-opening because we didn't typically go both places for a court rule. Um, and a lot of it involved calling the courts and saying, why is this little paragraph here? What happened to that language? And having to go back in time, and it became a much bigger deal. And because of that, we did look at them all. Um, to be certain that we weren't, um, that we were getting the cleanest copy we could. Um, and, I, and I do have a lot of faith in what we have there is the best we could do, but it's odd that there isn't an official official source for the rules. And the SJC website now points to this for their rules. Ah, it's a nice endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also have some of the rules up on their yeah, website. Uh, so so then, then came the biggest project. We had provided remote access to the database Lois Law for our patrons. And unlike in a, in a law school where your patrons are a very defined set, 
our patrons are anybody. Uh, anybody who comes in and gets a library card can use our databases remotely. So it can be a large group. It, it, I don't think it's that large a group, but it is a very, um, they use it a lot. And so Lois Law said to us, we're not going to renew your contract because you use it too much. And we said, we will pay you more, and they said, we're not interested. So they just flat out dropped us because we used the database too much. And so when we were looking for a replacement database, we surveyed our users and asked them what they missed most about not having Lois Law. And it was cases from the last 20 years, Massachusetts cases from the last 20 years. Well, at the time, Lawyers Weekly had on Massachusetts cases from the last 10 years. So we thought, OK, we will put on cases from the 10 years before that, and then we'll have 20 years, and we will find a replacement database. And we did find a replacement database. But we also were just ticked that we were constantly beholden to a vendor. That at some point, these are cases put out by the court. Like, why are we buying this? We work for the court. It all start, it just stopped making sense. And so we thought, whatever happens with another database, we're going to get cases in a format that no vendor, no budget cut, no, that nothing is going to take them away from us. And so we added that second tenure of cases. And just as we were finishing that project up, Lawyers Weekly decided no more access to cases for free. You have to be a subscriber now to get cases, which kind of proved our point. <laughs> so then we worked harder and got up cases so for 20 years. And then the, the project kind of snowballed. And we ended up, so now we have cases um, back to 1938, back to volume 300. Um, and the Google Books project, where they just scanned the full text of the books, goes up to volume 238. So there's this gap in the middle. Um, I'm not quite sure how far back Google Scholar goes. They've actually been very helpful in working with us with metadata and stuff so that we can create a, a search interface that works better. Um, but in the meantime, they're just here. They're here by citation. They're here by name. If you know the case you want, it's easy. Um, you can search them if you don't. So um, now the only cases that we're adding, when we add cases, we get a little report that tells us which cases are most cited by the cases that we have on that we don't have on. So then, so we, we go through backwards and add the most cited cases. So for some of these that are old, if I go to volume 58, they're here because they're, they're most cited by the newer cases. So that within those cases, you can click and hopefully find what you need. Uh, so that project goes on kind of bubbling slowly, but again, it's just adding these, these quite old cases. Uh, we've started adding two new kinds of cases, which are the cases of the um, District Court Appellate Division. And in this case, the District Court asked us if we would add their cases to our site because they weren't having success apparently getting them in their own. Um, so what we do with these, and these we have, we have just started. So the 2010 are complete and we're kind of working our way backwards in time with cases emailed from the district court. And with these and the land court opinions, which we're also doing, they're emailed to me in WordPerfect. And so the, we have to tweak them a little bit to make them go on the web. These are slip opinions or final yes. opinions? Well, the same. They're, they're the final opinion that's not yet published in a book. You know, it's the final opinion the day it's issued. So the day it's up. Uh, and where are the final opinions published? They are published. <laughs> The district court is published in something called the District Court Appellate Division Reporter. Right. It is not, right, it is not an official reporter. It's, I'm going to say Lawyers Weekly is the publisher of that. It's a small set of books. Are the final opinions different from the slip opinion? No. Or editorial corrections? Or? No. Okay. No, when they do have editorial corrections, when the land court does change, an, um, district court or land court changes an opinion, they email me the corrected opinion. And they say this is the, and then and then, then I make the change. That's different in many states, you know, where the yeah. slip right. opinion and it used is to be official. Right, and Massachusetts consult. used to issue slip opinions in a weird way, and then that were had an advance sheet site, and then they got a real site after. They don't do that now. Now they correct them. Massachusetts will send out little correction pages, and we use those. And, and this is a very unusual them. court. I mean, the Massachusetts Massachusetts court system is very unusual. The appellate division of the district court. It, you can sometimes get a trial de novo in the Superior Court and go through the whole system. It, it's, it's an unusual court. Yes, it's an odd, the District Court of Appellate Division is an odd little court. They have very interesting fact-based, yes. you know, yeah. it's, it's a very facty kind of, it's trial court. Um, the land court opinions, land court is another obscure Massachusetts, I, I don't know how common this is in the rest of the world, 
Um, these, I don't have a citation for. These are here by docket number or by name. Um, land court cases do come out in a private binder format called the Land Court Reporter. I'm not, I'm still nervous about using their citations, and I can read a lot of things that say, oh, you can use, you know, you can call it by the citation without violating copyright. And there's something about that that troubles me. The other thing is, just practically speaking, the opinions come out way before those, those volumes come out. So I have them on the web long before I have to go back in and add those citations. And they you're don't. In, you're in the Second Circuit, aren't you, for the Court of Appeals? First Circuit. Oh, the First, okay. See, if you're in the Second, you'd have a binding precedent that would. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it certainly seems obvious to me. <laughs> it's just not the, the thing. I, I've made a lot of, I've gone out on some limbs here, and that's not one I, that matters that much. Um, um, and so the land court opinions are here as well, and they go back to about 2008. Uh, so everything we do is about dealing with the circumstances in which we find ourselves and sort of getting around and by and through. Um, but it's all awkward, and it, it would be great if things were really in some systematic way put on the web with some kind of... Uh, I don't, I don't mean permanence in an archivist sense because we really rely on helping the people with the question in front of them and so the archiving we kind of leave to the academics. Um, but permanent in the sense that you can count on the format. I think we've been burned a lot by people. The Supreme Judicial Court, as you saw, they, they put their opinions up, but they're through Westlaw. Um, and it's, it's a Westlaw redirect that gets you to the opinion. And, and so you get nervous about relying on sources that, that may get taken away. And what we're trying to do is put up things that are there forever. So that's, that's our deal. Any questions? I'm just going to add, since the flight is gone and everything to the court is gone, <laughs> all of this has been done with this is not going into these notes. Um, we've just moved ahead and we're going to say, oops, we didn't know we were stepping on anybody's toes um, with basically no blessing. I mean, it's wonderful to have Judge Fine here um, advocating for the website. Not necessarily this part, she really likes the I play this stuff, but just so you know, as a group, in terms of you know asking a proposal to Linda or to ITV or whatever. We are just moving forward on the basis of access to justice with really, you know, we're using public funds, we're using like salary and stuff like that, but no one's blessing. The good news is the grassroots likes it. So I think we've got something there, but I think for all of you as we move forward, um, you need to be aware that, oops, I didn't know I was doing something wrong. <laughs> Anybody working for the state government, where do you think do you think we'll ever get there with digital authentication in Massachusetts for these mm -hmm. um, primarily legal material? I mean, some you know, states have. Had. I have absolutely no idea. We um, this is not um, authenticating public record documents that go up on the web is just not something that we've addressed. Mm -hmm. I think the kind of work you would like to do would certainly make people take a hard look at it. Um, obviously. Authentication in terms of persons comes up all the time, and we, we wrestle with that. Um, but authentication of documents for purposes of posting them online is, is possibly you looked at. It may be very easy, it may be very difficult. You know, there's, um, so there's two kinds of authentication. There, there's the authentication in which I am signing and saying, I, I guarantee every word in here is correct. Um, and because it's a digital signature, you can check that it hasn't changed. There's another thing, which is basically the rubber stamp uh, that is a digital signature that doesn't say, I guarantee everything here correct. It says, I received it on this date, right? I am whatever library. And if you want to verify that it hasn't been changed since I got it. Um, and I was wondering, had you ever considered digitally signing, for example, the CMR that you harvest? Um, it, it's really funny. I never thought about, until I heard these two in a different context, talking about authentication never crossed my mind for a sec. I just never thought about it. You know, we're like, there's information here. And of course people want to know. Right. <laughs> and so it is something I'm thinking about now. But and for a PDF document, it's not that difficult yeah, to do. And even for an external, for an HTML document, one can do um, a, a checksum that, that, that can 
help uh, verify. It's, it's literally, you know, ignorance on my part. It's just never crossed my mind. I also, um, when we put the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, database online over the very strong objections of the mm -hmm. SEC, um, one of the motivating factors we used is we digitally signed every SEC document on behalf of the United States government. <laughs> and we found that motivated the SEC very strongly to want to take that database over eventually. So um, if you were to sign on behalf of the Secretary of the Commonwealth, that would be true. I guess I'd say about the authentication piece. We're aware of the technologies, but questions that we have to deal with are if you're publishing 8 million documents a year, how much is that going to cost? And what kind of centralized or decentralized infrastructure do you want to put in place to enable agencies to be able to do that? And whether or not that would be very, very expensive at the scale at which we operate or not, I don't know. You know, you might consider asking the government printing office to send their chief information officer, Mike Wash, over to brief you because he has extensive experience doing that with the uh, FDSIS system um, where they do digitally sign all, all the public laws and, and the Federal Register and things like that. Um, and, it, and it really isn't that difficult uh, technical challenge to be doing and there's a variety of different levels of doing it. Um, authentication is one of those rat holes in, in which people often try to oversolve the problem, and again, you know, if you can't vouch for the document, you can certainly rubber stamp it as having been received. Um, the PACER system is a good example of that. The law librarian submitted a very strong petition um, suggesting that all PACER documents get the rubber stamp as opposed to the, the signature of the judge verifying that the brief was correct. Um, and so far, the administrative office hasn't um, acted on that. But, but GPO is a good font of, of technical information on that subject. Thank you. Did you say you had one of the vendors that took CMR from your website? Or yeah, you well, know? yeah, that's some um, fast case. I mean, even I, though it's not complete, <laughs> right? I mean, I think part of our beef is our beef is not so much that they sell it, but they, they sell these things as if they're real. You know, they link to us for rules of court, I believe, for the CMR, for you know, we we haven't about. <laughs> the CMR is far from, far from complete, and um, so it does make us nervous when people are, are taking it without having to chat with us about what is and isn't there and how good we think it is. Do you know anyone else that's done anything cool with it? Like, cool with No. There's a lot of law firms that take our stuff and put it on their site as if it's their own. Um, but they, have, they, haven't done, they haven't done anything interesting. They literally pull yeah. it. Yeah. But that's success, so that really is. That, that's people taking yeah. your stuff and using it. And, you know, yeah, and I it's guess it's no different than them coming to the library and reading the document. I, I think I think any librarian worries that it's more current now. It's better now. Yeah. What you're linking to was so okay two weeks ago. You know, you have that feeling of but but you're linking to bad data. Well, that's <laughs> but, the issue is they, um, they they harvest it once and they don't yes, update they don't it and update people it. get misled. And, exactly. And, that, that is and that's the librarian. Thing. On the other yeah. hand, when I search on things like CMR, you're number one in Google. In fact, you're over the uh, the secretary <laughs> to the Commonwealth. And, and that's really the answer to the authenticity. You know, the, the issue of somebody taking it and right. not doing as good a job. They, yeah. Make yours better and, and you'll rise to the top. And um, that, that helps solve that issue. Well, thank you Thank both. you very much.